Greetings. I am Roman Shuhaivich, and I am eager to unveil my tale to you. I was born on the last day of June 1907 in Krakowitz, a town that belonged to Austria-Hungary at the time. My father was a county judge, and my paternal grandfather, Vladimir Yosifovich Shukevich, was a notable ethnographer, author, and publisher of children's books. Growing up, I had a comfortable childhood thanks to my parents' provisions. In my teenage years, I attended gymnasiums in Kamenka, Strumilov, and Lviv, where I also became involved in scouting. It was during this time that I was influenced by Yevon Konovalez, the leader of an underground Ukrainian military organization who rented a room for my family. He instilled in me the idea that Ukrainian sovereignty should take precedence above all else, even if it meant disregarding the rights and lives of people of other nationalities. At the age of 19, while studying at the Danzig Polytechnic Institute, I committed my first murder. The victim was Jan Sabinski, a Polish school inspector. Between 1928 and 1934, I pursued my studies at the Faculty of Civil Engineering at the Lviv Polytechnic Institute. During this period, I also managed to serve in the Polish Army, join the newly formed Konovalets OUN, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, deemed extremist in Russia, with its activities prohibited by the Supreme Court, and assumed the position of chairman of the Ukrainian Sports Club. As an active student, I oversaw educational matters in Western Ukraine, channeling my energy into promoting the cause of Ukrainian nationalism. It is important to know that the OUN emerged in 1929 within the context of the Second Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, predominantly active in Eastern Galicia. The organization's local governing body, known as the Regional Executive of the OUN, found an assertive leader in Stefan Bandera in 1933. Under Bandera's direction, the OUN undertook several high-profile assaults against Polish officials, the most notable being the assassination of the Polish interior minister, Bronisław Paraki. This killing was a retaliation for the brutal pacification campaign led by Paraki against Ukrainian institutions in eastern Galicia in 1930. Paraki's demise was affected by three bullets to the back of his head in a Warsaw restaurant, leading to the subsequent arrest and conviction of the perpetrators in 1936. Germany's intelligence agency, the Abwehr, had been monitoring the OUN since its inception, and it established ties with the organization even before Hitler's rise to power. These ties involved training hundreds of OUN fighters in German intelligence schools and substantial financial aid. Nevertheless, the Germans were not blind supporters of the OUN. They arrested and deported Nikolai Lebed to Poland at the request of Polish authorities following the murder of Paraki. However, their collaboration continued until the commencement of the Second World War. Stalin's regime, alarmed by the escalating activities of the OUN, orchestrated the assassination of OUN leader Yevgeny Konovalets in Rotterdam in 1938. This event instigated a crisis within the OUN, revealing stark ideological differences between its radical members in Western Ukraine and its more moderate members abroad. The successor to Konovalets, Andrei Melnik, could not replicate the former leader's unifying influence, thus exacerbating existing tensions. March 1939 marked the Declaration of Independence for Carpathian Ukraine and Transcarpathia with its armed forces, the Carpathian Sich, under the control of the OUN. However, this state lasted mere days before Hungarian forces, supported by Poland, invaded. Despite the valiant efforts of the Carpathian Sich, Transcarpathia fell, and many of the Sich fighters were captured or executed. In the aftermath of these events, the OUN's relationship with Germany experienced temporary strain, with the Abwehr even slowing down its financial assistance partly due to the evolving Soviet-German relations. However, by mid-April 1939, the Germans reassured the OUN leadership of their continued support for Ukrainian independence. Following German diplomatic interventions, Hungary released several hundred Ukrainian nationalists who later joined the Ukrainian Legion under Colonel Roman Sushko to partake in the Polish campaign. In August 1939, Andrei Melnik was officially confirmed as the leader of the OUN, succeeding Konovalets. Despite initial resistance, Melnik's leadership was grudgingly accepted, largely due to the absence of his main rival, Stefan Bandera, who was serving a life sentence for his terrorist activities against Poland. Bandera, however, escaped from the Brest prison amidst the chaos of the German invasion of Poland and made his way to Lviv, then under Soviet occupation. From here, Bandera reoriented the OUN's efforts against their new primary enemy, the USSR. By late 1939, he had managed to mobilize the organization's 8-9,000 members, potentially up to 12,000, 
if we include active sympathizers towards an armed uprising in Galicia and Volhynia. The OUN was deeply divided at this point. Melnik's faction believed in aligning with the Third Reich and its military objectives, while Bandera's faction argued for the necessity of an armed underground, prepared for guerrilla warfare, even against the Nazis. Their only point of consensus was that the USSR was their main adversary. In December 1939, the Bandera-led Krakow branch of the OUN mobilized its members and instructed them to arm themselves without coordinating with Melnik's central wire of the OUN. The interception of this message by the Nakhvid, the Soviet secret police, led to widespread arrests among the OUN leadership in western Ukraine, a clear reminder of the high-stakes, clandestine world in which these organizations operated. The OUN concluded its third conference, having decisively confirmed the formation of the Ukrainian insurgent army UPA and identified its key opponents, the Nazis, Poles, and Soviet partisans. Following the conference, notable transformations took place within the organization. Nikolai Lebed, who had been increasingly criticized by his fellow leaders for his authoritarian style of leadership, was ousted during a meeting of the key leadership on May 11, 13, 1943. Power then shifted to the Bureau of the Wire, led by Zinovi Matla, Dmitry Mayevsky, and Roman Shuhevich. Shuhevich emerged as the de facto leader of the OUN, securing three essential roles, the head of the OUN, the commander of the UPA, and the secretary of the UGVR. His ascension marked a potential move away from the extreme right rhetoric previously dominating the OUN, although this shift was clouded by the subsequent course of events. In a significant administrative reshuffle, I dismissed the OUN's regional guide to the zoos, Mikhail Stefaniak, replacing him with Vasil Okramovich. At this point, it's important to note that even before the third OUN conference, Taras Borove's UPA detachments were already operational in the woods, though they resisted aligning with the OUN, choosing not to partake in the mass violence against the Polish population. Despite attempts at negotiation between the OUN and Borovets faction, no common ground could be reached, largely due to the atrocities committed against the Poles by Bandera's troops. From March to mid-April 1943, the UPA ranks swelled by 4,000 to 6,000 auxiliary police officers. By the end of 1943, deserters from German units along with forces from integrated detachments of Borovets and the OUN constituted about half of the entire UPA. In April 1943, Germany began forming the 14th SS Grenadier Division Galicia, consisting of Galician volunteers and the Ukrainian Liberation Army from Eastern Ukrainians, primarily prisoners of war. OUN's stance towards this development was complex and divided, while some leaders, including Chuhevich, saw it as an opportunity for nationalists to gain military training, others resisted, a compromise was struck where the OUN publicly denounced the division but covertly infiltrated it with their personnel. After the Battle of Brody, surviving members of the division significantly boosted the UPA ranks. On May 1, 1943, the main UPA team was established under Vasily Ivakiv, and after his demise, Dmitry Klyachkivsky took command. It was under Klyachkivsky that armed units of the independent Derzovniki were renamed as the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, UPA, at the end of May 1943. The UPA underwent further structural development in June 1943, with the creation of military field gendarmerie and the security service. By early August, the UPA consisted of two groups, UPA South and UPA North, following a major reorganization triggered by the third extraordinary large gathering of the OUN. Additional groups were formed to account for the increasing numbers. On August 27, 1943, a decree issued by the main team of the UPA introduced military ranks and designations, and all members of the UPA were henceforth called Cossacks in 1943. A voluntary force mobilization of the male population commenced in UPA. Controlled areas? The UPA reached its zenith in the spring to early summer of 1944, with around 25,000 to 30,000 armed fighters. By this point, 60 of the UPA commanders and soldiers were Galicians. 30 were from Balin and Polsies, and only 10 swear from the Dnieper region. Simultaneously, the UPA continued to expand geographically. In July 1944, the Bukovina Ukrainian Self-Defense Army was created in the Chernivtsi region, soon being incorporated into the UPA West. Transcarpathia, which was under Hungarian rule until 1944, didn't join the UPA's territorial structure until 1945, despite intermittent UPA raids following the Hungarians' expulsion. Beginning in the late 1940s, references emerged hinting at the involvement of Jewish individuals in the UPA. 
most notably in the capacity of medical personnel. From the spring of 1943 onwards, it appears that the UPA harnessed the skills of Jewish people for their benefit. Some managed to escape the grim circumstances they were thrust into, but regrettably for many, a tragic end seemed inevitable. A key aspect to consider in this context is that the concerted effort to annihilate the Jewish population was primarily orchestrated by the security service forces. Additionally, this genocide was kept concealed from the majority of regular UPA members. Publications from the UPA in the 1950s included mentions and memoirs of a Jewish woman named Stella Krenzbach. She was depicted as a member of the UPA who later served in the Israeli Foreign Ministry. However, subsequent investigations revealed that Stella may have been an invented character, a fabrication for propaganda purposes. Let's return to my story. I had a talent for playing the piano, and it was something I truly loved. In 1928, I joined the Evgeny Revelers Quartet, later known as Elviv Revelers, as their pianist. Interestingly, my younger brother Yuri, who tragically lost his life during the unloading of the Elviv prison in June 1941, was a soloist in the same quartet. During the summer and autumn of 1930, I led an anti-Polish sabotage operation in my hometown of Krakowiec. This included attempts on the lives of Polish officials. I was accused of participating in the elimination of the Polish Sejim ambassador, Tadeusz Golałko, and orchestrating the murder of police commissioner Emilian Chekhov. It is worth noting that the actual perpetrator of Chekhov's murder was my future brother-in-law, Yuri Berezinski. On March 22, 1932, Yuri Berezinsky carried out the assassination of Milian Chekhov, who was the head of the Ukrainian Investigative Police Department in Lviv. Chekhov had been actively working against the Ukrainian underground and was involved in the investigation of important cases involving members of the OUN. The underground movement was aware that Chekhov hailed from a Ukrainian family, but had aligned himself with the Poles in their fight against the Ukrainian liberation movement. Consequently, the leadership of the OUN decided to hold him accountable for his anti-Ukrainian activities and, at the same time transform the act of terrorism into a public demonstration of our determination to fight for our cause. This particular attempt became one of the most prominent political assassinations carried out by UN members in the 1930s. In April 1932, I was arrested by the Polish police on suspicion of belonging to the UVO, but I was soon released due to a lack of evidence. Yuri, on the other hand, led a group of expropriators from the Aun who launched an attack on the Polish post office in Gorodok on November 30, 1932. Among the attackers were Dmitry Danilishin, Vasily Bilas, Marian Zurakovsky, Piotr Maximsev, Stefan Dolinsky, Stefan Gaspiz, Stefan Maschak, Vladimir Starik, Grigory Faida, Stefan Tsap, and Grigory Kupetsky. As the attackers, wearing masks to conceal our identities, we approached the post office building from different sides of the street. Once there, we split into four groups with specific tasks. One group entered the post office, Another headed towards the cash register, a third group disabled the telephones, and the fourth group remained in the corridor as backup. However, our attack did not go as planned. To our surprise, all the postal employees, contrary to our expectations, were armed with revolvers. As soon as we entered the hall and ordered everyone to raise their hands, a barrage of shots came at us and the doors to the cash register were locked. Some sources claim that it was Berezinski who initiated shooting, as he had control over five postal workers. Without wasting any time, Dmitry Danilishin fired shots at the door of the cash register, breaking the window through which money was exchanged. Vasily Bilas then entered the cash register through the broken window and took the money. Bilas and Danilishin swiftly made their escape from the building, signaling to the rest of us that it was time to retreat. As we ran out of the post office, we came under fire from nearby houses. It was during this exchange of gunfire that Berezinski suffered a serious injury. Rather than risk falling into the hands of the Polish authorities alive, he made the decision to take his own life. After completing my engineering studies and receiving my diploma, I worked for a few months at a construction company. Following that, I joined forces with a like-minded individual and opened an advertising bureau. Unfortunately, my creative pursuits were abruptly halted by my arrest, which occurred in connection with the assassination attempt on Polish Interior Minister Bronisław Raki. In 1935, after the trial of Stepan Bandera and his supporters, I was sentenced to four years in prison. In 1938, I was released from prison thanks to a general amnesty and made my way to Germany. There, I underwent military training at the Munich Military Academy. It was during this time that I organized numerous anti-Polish and anti-Hungarian demonstrations in Lviv in October 1938. As a result, I was arrested and held for three days. At the beginning of 1939, 
As a certified engineer, I played a role in the establishment of another paramilitary Ukrainian nationalist organization called the Carpathian Sitch, through various means, including robberies. We acquired firearms and ammunition for our cause. From September 1939 onward, my main objective was to organize armed resistance in the western Ukrainian territories that had separated from the Soviet Union. Ukrainian nationalists held hope that Germany would support the creation of a national army, but this was not part of the war mats plans. Consequently, we had to settle for the formation of the Noctegol Battalion, in which I served as the Ukrainian deputy commander. In June 1941, the Noctegol Battalion, along with the Bradenburg Regiment, advanced into Lviv ahead of the Wehrmacht. Tragically, this led to a violent pogrom in the city, resulting in the brutal killing of thousands of Poles and Jews. The Ukrainian militia, which was formed with my support, actively participated in these horrific acts. In July, the Nactical Battalion moved eastward, engaging in combat with Red Army units and targeting individuals of Jewish descent. On June 30, 1941, I issued orders for my fighters to seize control of Lviv and carry out the extermination of nearly 4,000 Jews and Poles residing there. It was for this operation that I personally received recognition from Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the head of the SS Security Department. In 1942, I assumed the role of deputy commander in the 201st Security Battalion, which operated under the authority of S. Obergruppenfuhrer Erich von dem Bach, this unit also known as the Ukrainian Legion. Spent nine months stationed in Belarus, where we were responsible for eliminating over 2,000 Soviet partisans. The brutal actions committed by my battalion caused outrage not only within the Soviet Union, but also among Belarusian nationalists who organized an assassination attempt against me. Additionally, I am regarded as one of the organizers of the Volin Massacre. Despite holding the rank of S. Hoffman, during the latter part of the war, the factions led by me fought not only against the Red Army, but also against the Wehrmacht. Ukrainian nationalists perceived the Nazis as temporary and relatively preferable compared to the Bolsheviks, who were seen as occupiers of our homeland. In January 1944, I assumed the position of Commander-in-Chief of the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, the UPA, which is recognized as an extremist organization in Russia, with its activities prohibited by the Supreme Court. In May 1945, I published an appeal to the fighters and commanders of the UPA, proclaiming the Army's contribution to the defeat of Germany. The sabotage activities carried out by my structures persisted in the Lviv, Ternopil, and ivano frankivsk regions until 1948. However, on September 3, 1949, the UPA combat units ceased their resistance against the Soviet government. The war crimes committed by the leader of the ONUPA had severe repercussions, not only for myself, but also for those close to me in my personal life. My sister and wife were sentenced to 10 years of correctional labor camps, my 62-year-old mother received three years of imprisonment, and my father was exiled, which ultimately led to his death in a hospital. After my mother's arrest, my children, Yuri and Maria, ended up in an orphanage. Despite the repressions they faced, most of my relatives lived long lives. My sister Natalia passed away in 2010 at the age of 88, and my son Yuri, despite spending three decades in prison, died at the age of 89, having even served as a People's Deputy of Ukraine in the 8th and served as a People's Deputy of Ukraine in the 8th Convocation. From 1990 to 1994, Yuri Shuhevich headed the UNA UNSO, an organization recognized as extremist and banned in Russia by the Supreme Court. He passed away in November 2020, due to a long-term illness for which he was receiving treatment in Munich. At the time of her brother's death, my daughter Maria, born in 1940, was still alive. My own life came to an end on March 5, 1950, as a result of an operation conducted by the Ministry of State Security, the village of Belogorsha, which later became part of Elviv, was the location of my death. I sustained a fatal bullet wound, but the circumstances surrounding my elimination remain a subject of varying accounts, with no participants receiving recognition through Soviet state awards. My body was cremated and the ashes were scattered. In the year marking Shuhevich's centenary, President of Ukraine Petro Poroshenko posthumously awarded the native of Krakowitz the title of Hero of Ukraine, although this decree was later canceled by a court decision in 2010. The Post of Ukraine issued a stamp featuring my photograph and streets and avenues in numerous Ukrainian cities bear my name in honor of my role as the leader of the OUN-UPA.